Hello viewers, you join me in the glorious sunshine here in New Jersey, the United States of America, where I'm delighted to be enjoying the hospitality of my good friend Howie Rutledge Tran. Hello Howie. Hello, <laughs> good to see you Lloyd. <laughs> Thank you for coming. It's really, really good to be here because obviously you and I have been friends on Facebook for a while and you know we've been sharing messages and that kind of thing, so to finally meet in the flesh. Yes, it's nice. <laughs> it's good. And uh, a lot of viewers to my channel will probably already recognize your name because you've been on uh, Reveal, haven't you, with Trey Bundy? We did. We did an interview last December. And that was a fascinating interview because you were actually kind of on the ground in, in Brooklyn just before the move to Warwick, weren't you? Yes. And as I recall, you ran into a governing body member? Yes, uh, uh, Tight Pants Tony. Uh, tight Pants Tony. Yeah, we... The legend, Tony Morris. <laughs> the legend that is Tony Morris. I, well, I, I can only say I'm extremely envious of you. Yeah, I would have liked to have been there. Most of what we've seen was the backside. <laughs> yeah, he was running away, <laughs> as was, I recall. He was on his feet. Yeah, he was pretty fast. But Trey caught him right as it, before the door closed <laughs> and put his foot in there. That's just astonishing. In fact, I, I, I think I'm just going to um, play you now just a clip of that audio for those who aren't familiar. Nobody else. Howie and I are about two blocks from the main watchtower building when he spots someone, a member of the governing body. That's Tony Morris, go get him. Now I've sat in Morris's lobby and called him at home, trying to ask him why his organization covers up child abuse. Mr. Morris? This guy's word is law to eight million Jehovah's Witnesses, so it's weird to see him just walking down the street. He sees me coming and crosses the street to get away. When I catch up to him, I'm out of breath. Mr. Morris? Excuse me, Mr. Morris? I don't know you. I know uh, you don't. My name's Trey Bundy. I'm a reporter at the Center for Investigative Reporting. Yeah. I've been uh, writing stories and uh, producing radio stories this year about uh, Jehovah's Witnesses and child sex abuse. Mm -hmm. um, do you have a second to talk to me? Not really. I'm going out to preach the good news of the kingdom. Okay. I saw yeah. that you... Um, he had just uh, released a video uh, where he blames I child know, abuse we on homosexuals. The right. I asked him about that. Can you talk to me about that at all? It's all in the broadcast. And with that, someone opens a door to a building a few feet away, and Morris rushes inside. After calling and emailing the governing body for months with no response, after reading through stacks of their documents, after flying from California to New York, I finally find one of these guys, and seconds later, he's gone. So that was an astonishing little piece of footage that you guys picked up. So talk us through, um, well, first of all, perhaps we should go all the way back to how, how did you actually become involved with Jehovah's Witnesses in the first place? Well, my mother and father, uh, they were second generation witnesses. And uh, though they were inactive most of my growing up, I knew about the witnesses. I knew about, uh, you know, we didn't celebrate holidays. So I had a, a little bit of a background with that. Um, and then later, when my parents had, after they had divorced, uh, we moved to Oklahoma City, where my grandmother was a, a longtime uh, pioneer since the 50s, and she was very zealous with it. And so she was trying to reactivate my mother, and uh, and the rest of us kids as well. It it was when I was uh, about 14 years old that um, we had not not been in Oklahoma City very long, and my grandmother was trying to encourage us uh, to become active again. Uh, with the witnesses, um, that my mother was cleaning house and she found a, a magazine uh. under my bed. And I had not seen, uh, I lifted it from the local mall. And uh, I, you know, I was a, a kid from the, the Ozark Mountains, uh, from the country. And uh, Oklahoma City was a little bit more of a city, urban area. And I had seen the magazine and uh, it was a, a magazine that featured uh, nude men. Right. And so she... Uh, that was uh, unbelievable to her, right? And, uh, and of course, I was I was devastated, and and I was I was scared, and uh, and of course, I had struggled with being gay, having these feelings yeah. uh, since I was very young, and uh, and so that there usually is, you'd you'd want that kind of discovery to come about through a conversation rather than through that kind of discovery being made. I would assume. Yeah, I yeah. definitely. Yeah. Um, even then, uh, most wait. They wait until they're, they're yeah. Older. It's it's never easy to come out, and especially to have it uh, forced out at that at yeah. that age. So my 
my gra my mother uh, then went to my grandmother, who then went to uh, my uncle, who was the PO in the local congregation, and and that led to a family intervention, and uh, and then so that led to us all being in the living room and discussing my problem, oh. and then how they were going to go about fixing it, and I didn't know any. I mean, I was just 14 years old, so I didn't know anything, uh, you know. Other than that, I realized that I had a problem, and uh, you know, they discussed that it was what what might have been the cause of spiritual sickness, and that you know there were a number of contributing factors. It could have been the the, the poor example of my father, uh, and also a lack of spirituality. They said, and uh, and that it was a spiritual sickness. And it, you know, at the time, there were articles that talked about those who had had this problem, and through study and prayer, they were actually able to overcome it and able to go on and lead normal lives and, and get married and even have kids. And so those were read to me and I had never heard of that before. And I, I uh, latched onto that as, as that could help me. And, mm -hmm. and so my uncle, uh, who was there also, the, the PO in our local hall, he, uh, he set about trying to help me and uh, using the, uh, the youth book, getting, your, getting the best out of it. Uh, in there, of course, yeah, it's, it's equates homosexuality with masturbation, as I yes, recall. Yeah. Yes, and that was the thing because I had just uh, started, yeah, you know, uh, becoming a uh, I don't know what you call it. <laughs> you know, I you started tinkering. How do we, yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I discovered yeah, that and, yeah. and, uh, and had been getting good at it for a couple of years right, by yeah. then, and and okay, so uh, you know, that, that too, you know, it said. Yeah. Uh, contributes to you becoming a homosexual right and that I could with prayer and study overcome this spiritual sickness and I could lead a normal life and you know a 14 year old kid I I was uh, desperate for something I was very uh, I was sick to myself at what I was I felt I was and and I was ashamed of myself and so uh, they began studying with me and I began to try and change everything about my life up to that point so that I could cure myself of this mental sickness and um, and that that is what spurned my becoming the little zealot I became at that time and that was I immediately uh, started setting spiritual goals I read my Bible every morning I I started a prayer and ended you tried it with, to overcompensate basically yes yeah. yeah I got rid of my worldly music you know yeah. anything that I felt might represent Satan trying to make inroads in my life mm. And so I just tried to wash everything. Well, that just naturally led me then. I started auxiliary pioneering while I was in school. I had a rough time in school, I think because also they might have noticed that I, I seemed different than the other kids. And there was some bullying and name calling. Uh, so I, I actually quit school at that time. And I used pioneering uh, as, a, as a reason, but I did want to pioneer. And I started regular pioneering in 92 when I was 16. Mm. And I just rode my bicycle and checked out the, the four territories near my apartment complex. Mm. And that was my pioneer territory. And, right. and I, I plugged along with that. And I, and I thought maybe one day I would move to where the need was great. Mm. I know I thought maybe that might be a good thing for me. I still struggled with the problem. It never went away. So I felt that there was something uh, inherently wrong with me. Mm. And, you know, that's... It's a terrible thing to have that, especially as a yeah. kid. I'm, and you have setbacks, such as with mm. the, we talked about the masturbation. Mm. Well, in that youth getting the best out of it book, it talks about that to help you overcome that problem, you should keep a calendar. And so I would keep that calendar and you mark on there when you masturbate, and then you're supposed to make the amount of days between your last relapse and the next one longer. And so... Um, my uncle, the PO, would check my masturbation calendar. Wow! And to make sure that I was, I was That's having surely way above his job description. I, well, that. at the time, I thought he was doing the most loving thing to help such a person as myself. Oh, can you I know? see and your I, masturbation calendar? Yeah, I, well, I was ashamed because, of course, every relapse was a was a was a, a, a black mark on me. And uh, but I, but I tried, and I did do good. You know, I would go a few months, and then, but then. There you go again. And then I would beat myself up. And then constantly, you know, you beat yourself up for every thought. So I felt I was inherently not as good as everyone else. Mm -hmm. And I always had that weighing on me. And I, so I was overachieving, I think, in everything else, mm -hmm. in my studying and in my talks. I, and anybody asked me to do anything, I would do it. And I thought about I would move to where the need was great. And then when I turned 19, 
the circuit overseer came into our neighborhood. I mean, he came for his, his visit. And, uh, it, um, oh, I can't think of his name, Gary something. But he and his wife, Barbara. And he said to me, uh, this was after the Kingdom Ministry had come out in March of 95, saying that they needed help at Bethel. Right. You know, every once in a while they would do that. They'd put out a KM that said, workers needed, you know, send all the brothers there. But I, I in my mind, thought that that sounded like a great place. I mean, obviously, that's where all the spiritual people would go. But up to that point, I didn't seriously think that me, with my problem, that I would ever qualify to be there. Mm. I just didn't think, you know, I, I felt that that was probably, I never had visited before. I never been. I mean, I because that was far from where I live mm. to go all the way to Brooklyn from Oklahoma. But I, I didn't imagine that would be a place that they would accept me or that I would even qualify for. So when the CEO came around, and I guess you know he went through the publisher records, mm. and he he was looking for any brother who might qualify, he said, you know, you should go, Howie, you should go. And he talked to my uncle, the PO, and the two of them said, you know, that's where you need to be. And I, I spoke to my uncle privately and I said to him, um, Paul, I, I don't know. I mean, don't, because of my problem, I don't think that they would want me there. And he said, don't worry. I talked to Gary about it, the CEO. Perfect place for you. They send a lot of brothers like you there. I'm sure they do. <laughs> and, 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 you know, it's, and they'll straighten yeah. you right out, yeah. you know. And so I thought to myself, yes. That would be, if any place on earth, the, the house of God, Bethel, the spiritual paradise, where all the, where all the giants, and, and I, no doubt, I thought to my mind, I'd never been, but I thought it must be like the temple where Jehovah's Spirit just fills it constantly. Mm. And uh, I don't know, I, I felt that there I would have the best chance at being cured. Mm. Because I, I believe, I knew. Isn't it shocking though, that you have to speak in those terms of, thinking of it as something that needs to be cured. Yeah. Well, now, because, of course, now we realize that that's, that's just uh, nonsense. Yeah, yeah. But I mean... But back then, that was your mindset. Yeah. So you, you moved to Bethel yeah. in the yeah. hopes that this will be this wonderful kind of rehabilitation yes. thing. And am I, am I correct in saying that, it, in a way, it did rehabilitate you, but not in the way you were expecting? But yes, it, it was uh, a kind of rehabilitation. And it definitely was mind uh, mind opening, um, and at first it seemed as though it would be the place that would um, cure me, or yeah. or at least help me manage this this problem that I had been managing uh, mm. for so many years. Um, of course, uh, it, it was while at Bethel that I realized and came to the realization that it was not the truth. Right. And uh, and of course, it took me almost eleven years. <laughs> <laughs> to finally uh, to get out. And what, what caused that realization? Well, well um, it was you know it wasn't because you, you, yeah. you, you would think most witness if there's any witnesses watching this, yeah, they would associate Bethel as being the house of God, yes, the place where the faithful and discreet slave resides. How could anybody come to the realization in that spiritual environment that it's not the truth? Yeah, and yeah, how could it not be? How yeah. could it not be right? Uh, exactly right. And and so many people uh, they go to Bethel, they visit, they see it, they see it just as I had imagined it to yeah. be. Uh, like like you said, a, a spiritual they, paradise. How they have kind of like um, like a, a drive-by impression. Yeah. Of what it's like. And 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 it is. And and a lot of uh, you know, for example, in morning worship things would happen uh, at, in the Bethel family. Yeah. And in morning worship, they would say, uh, I remember one of my first morning worship, where they would say, this is a family matter. We only keep it in the family. Uh. And, and you know, there are a lot of things that you probably notice as a witness uh, in all your assignments, various assignments, that, that you have to overlook. Mm. And you say to yourself, well, it's the imperfections of the brothers and sisters. Uh, you know, at Jehovah, he uses imperfect people to get the job done. Mm. And so it's that kind of circular mentality. And then, and then because of that, then you overlook things that normally would make you pause and think, well, how could that be? How could that be going on? It just kind of gets filed in the mental pending tray. And but, if you yeah. have no knowledge base to work off of, mm. I mean, you have nothing, uh, because, you know, it's, it's an enclosed environment. Uh, pretty much what you know and what you learn is within the confines of that environment. Mm. And so unless you have a knowledge base that takes you outside of that, mm. 
there's not really any reason to question, you know, as Peter said, where else will I go? Um, mm. This is all you know. This is, you go nowhere else mm. when this is all you know. But it, for me, the, um, the leaving was not overnight, as probably with yourself. You, things come up. Yeah. You notice. Or maybe you allow yourself to read something. Yeah. And it's a gradual awakening. Mm. And for me, it was the same. I, I was working with Carl Klein of the governing body. Um, I, I worked in cleaning services for the first couple of years. I worked on the day crew uh, cleaning toilets. Then I worked on the night crew doing security. And then I was an assistant overseer on a cleaning crew briefly. And then I was called into the office. And now, mind you, at this time, I... I was still continuing studying. Yeah. Uh, doing, I was really going overkill with my spiritual pursuits even there because I was still struggling with those same problems. And so I felt that I had to do more even than the average Bethelite so as to work on my personal issues. Mm. And so I, I would, and also, uh, for example, I, I would go early to morning worship an hour before it started and I would study and read. And um, one of the reasons why I did that too was because our Bethel rooms, you know, we were we had commune community showers, and and if you waited during that last hour before morning worship, there would be lines of, of brothers waiting to use the shower down the hall, and uh, so there'd be all these half dressed or naked brothers waiting, and and that was not good for me to see, and so I would so go you very were trying early. To avoid that yes, situation. I would avoid. So I got up very early, and I would go have my shower when no one else was showering. And then I would go to morning worship, and I would study. So you were really taking it quite seriously from that point. Oh, of view. I was trying very yeah. hard. Yeah, I was trying very hard because I felt that the only reason why I was still having a problem was because there was something wrong with me, and I believed that. And so, yeah, that was always on my mind. And so, under what capacity were you in close proximity with Carl Klein? Well, uh, and so. They noticed, I think, that I was very serious, a very serious student. And even yeah. at Bethel, if you're very serious with your studies and mm. very serious and you know theocratic, sometimes that gets you a little recognition. And at the time, I was uh, at Milton Hinchel's table for morning worship. And so um, I think maybe he might have put a good word in for me in the office. So Carl Klein, he, he was an infirm member of the governing body who had had a fall on a zone visit in Germany and it had caused uh, some uh, problems with his equilibrium. And so when he came back and finally got rehabilitated to where he could walk, he couldn't walk well. And so they, they needed a brother, they wanted to train a brother to go with him and help him to the meetings, help him home, help him starting with his shower in the morning and until he got, mm. got into bed. And so that's what I, I did, I worked with, with him. I was called in and assigned with him. And so that was, eye-opening because because of that assignment I was able to see or peer into a, a part of Bethel that that even few Bethelites get to see and and some of it was very uh, very awing and encouraging but some of it was very discouraging well obviously viewers are going to want to know what <laughs> what the juicy stuff is well, so are there any juicy interesting parts, anecdotes well, you can share um, now, as far as the juicy stuff, what helped me mm. in the waking up process? I'll talk about yeah. about that. In in that, and, and it wasn't the um, I don't know what you call it. It wasn't the final thing, right? But it was part of making me think. Yeah, yeah. And and that was um, one of the jobs I had with him was he his eyes would get tired. He would have me read correspondence, and so I would read to him out loud his mail and uh, manuscripts that were circulating, and um, memos from the meetings. I mean, at first it was just mail, but then as he grew to trust me, uh, it was everything. Right. And in there you see, uh, not much, but sometimes there'll be issues or problems with the friends in the field. And all of those things are a bit discouraging to read about. Um, nothing in particular out of the, you know, out of the ordinary, but some of those things. But, but you're basically seeing how imperfect yes. the imperfect organization is. And you're seeing is. that yeah. it's very big. Well, yeah. oh, oh, over here in Africa, they're having a problem with uh, one, some in the congregation with witchcraft, uh, demonism. And they're writing in asking for help. And, and what they're doing to try and fix the problem seems really unusual to me. Mm. 
And then the advice given about, uh, you know, you need to speak, you know, it's the branch writing and what are we going to do about it? it? Just unusual things sometimes like that. But, but one thing that really stood out to me um, was a, a people who I didn't know at the time, but after reading the letter, it became obvious apostates would write in. Right. And um, one letter really stood out to me. And this letter is the first... Uh, First bit of information that made me think outside of the bubble. Yeah. And I realized that there was something else. Right. And that was someone who wrote in with, it was, a, it was about a 12-page letter, and it was discussing 607 BCE. Mm. And they were providing documentation of a historical nature from reputable archaeologists who said that that date is not possible. Yeah. I never even knew it was a question. Mm. I had believed up to that point that it, 100% that it was historically sound. Yeah. Well, you, you just assume it is because it's yes. there in black and white in the books. You know? Oh, yes. Well, yeah. it's right in the publications. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> From Jehovah's Holy Holy Spirit right yeah. there, right? The Spirit inspired. Uh, so when I read that, I was like, whoa, this is, this is, I mean, I, I read part of it. I kind of paused because I thought yeah. Brother Klein would want me to shred it in the shredder next to the desk. Yeah. But he's like, oh, carry on, carry on. And I'm like, okay. And I'm reading it, I'm reading it. And I think, okay, he, we read the whole thing, covered it, you know, the whole, all 12 pages. We're going to shred it. I says, you want me to shred it, Brother Klein? And he's like, no, 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 no. We've got to take it to Gene Smalley. And uh, Gene Smalley was, was the uh, Bethel official, Bethel uh, librarian, right. but he also is a senior writer in the writing department right. and, and writes a lot of talks and a lot of the magazine articles had his name and books had his name on it. And so we went down, his office was down the hall, we went down to his office and I helped him. He gave it to him and then they, they were going to file it. Gene had a key to a locked room and in that room they kept uh, the different things that people wrote in that were of, of interest. Apostate, and it, an yes, apostate library. It was an apostate library. Wow. And, it, and, and, the, and it was just like a walk in closet, and the shelves weren't full, but they had books, and there was a filing for filing. And, and I, ah, I was like, oh, okay, well, that makes sense. You think to yourself, well, that makes sense, because, you know, how else are you going to give a, a reply to those that demand it unless you know what they're up to, you know? Yeah. You got to know what's going on. Um, though later, I, another part of me said, well, why is it then in the field? We're cautioned so much about not partaking of the table of demons. Yeah. And we're told that don't even, don't even peek at it, don't even touch it, have nothing to do with apostasy. Mm. Yet here is a, a library full of their literature that only these spiritual giants in Bethel have access to. Uh, you know, and they're able to peruse it and they're spiritually strong enough to handle it. You know, so I felt that that was, among other things that I saw, that that was a double standard. But that letter stuck with me. The idea that 607 BCE, I, I, I wasn't 100% ready to throw out the idea, but I I'd never thought about that. And, I, and it kind of stuck with me, that idea. At this time, uh, Harry Poloyan was my table head. And he's a, a senior writer at Bethel as well. He's, he's actually um, Bethel's only Harvard graduate writer. Really? Right. Yeah. So he, uh, he used to work for the Wall Street Journal and, and converted to the witnesses and then was called immediately into Bethel. Because, you know, Bethel likes anyone who with, a, with a prestigious education to come right to Brooklyn. Even though they dis dissuade yes. higher education, they'll yes. happily take the Is fruits that a of double it. standard? I mean, <laughs> is that why yeah. we have 11 doctors and some oh. of them didn't even go to finish their medical school? I mean, they became witnesses and they were yeah. like, oh, uh, maybe I should stop. And then Bethel encouraged them to finish and then come to Bethel. Yeah. Through the circuit overseer, through a circuit overseer. Mm. And, uh, and that's why we have so many lawyers. Uh, many of them were sent to, to school from Bethel. And uh, oh, 30 or so nurses, all of them with degrees, some with masters, who, who were viewed as spiritually sick when they were going to school. But then once they got the degree, they're called right to Bethel. You know, I mean, anyway, that's, a, that's another story. But so I asked Harry, Harry Poloy, and he was our, my table head. I, he and I, he was very easy to talk to, very gregarious. And he, he would just, he's hilarious. And he would just tell you like it is. And I... We talked about many things. Like he and I would talk about all kinds of stuff that probably, if if, if the wrong person was listening to, would wonder, uh, 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 what's going on here. So I I wanted to ask him about six oh seven, 
because he was the only one that I could imagine that might be able to reassure me that, you know, oh yeah, they're they're crazy. Those historians are crazy. It's it's a load of it's a conspiracy. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's Satan. <laughs> it's Satan. You know, like the witnesses used to believe Satan planted the dinosaur bones, yeah. and now Satan is planting, you know, archaeological evidence. So, I, in a roundabout way. I asked Harry, I said, uh, in one of our morning conversations, I said to him, you know, someone wrote in a letter to Carl Klein, and I read it to him, and it talked about 607 BCE and all this historical information. I said, isn't that crazy that someone would write that? Yeah. I mean, that's just, it boggles my mind. How could it not be right? Yeah. And he got serious, and he looked at me, and he said, uh, well, Howie, he said, you know, we shouldn't let things like this surprise us too much. He said, because really we don't know everything that we know is right. He said, now, he says, this is the truth. There is no other organization that has the truth. But we know that prophecies change, our understanding changes. And uh, it was then he elaborated to me that even though it may not be true, it's the 100% true. true. He didn't come out and say, yeah. but he said that... Um, he said that some things, you know, we need to go along with for the time being. Uh, and that just makes and me And Jehovah wonder, will straighten it out in his due time. That just makes me wonder how many people were like, are like him yes. at, at this moment in Bethel. In not Bethel. agreeing with things, but just oh. kind of going along with it. And you know, he didn't agree with a lot of things. Mm. I mean, but that's another conversation. Yeah. But I, I know after his wife Rosie died. Yeah. And he was very sad about that. I mean, just sick about it. And he himself vocalized. He would often vocalize like little things like this. He said, he says, I cannot believe that I will not be still married to my dear Rosie in the new system. He says, I do not believe that. I never will believe it. And it is wrong. Wow. But he, you know, I mean, he was in grief, but I mean, he vocalized, you know, the idea that, you know, when, when we're resurrected, we'll be as angels, that that has to be a screwed up interpretation. He said that more than once. Yeah. And he would, he would be vocal, but he's, here's someone that actually worked at writing uh, worked in the writing department. He was responsible writer. for disseminating the official he passing wrote. line. Yeah. He said he saw. He says he said to me. He says when it comes to prophecy, he said he said for one thing, there's this idea that the friends need something to help them keep mentally occupied. That's about in a roundabout way that he said. Keep them busy. Uh, keep yeah. them busy. And now there's another thing too, and that is he said that he said don't don't hinge everything on that. He says, because we are going to be shocked when we get into that new world and we see just how little we knew. That's what he said. And at first I thought to myself, yeah, yeah, that's right, because, you know, we don't know much. We're imperfect. This is Jehovah's organization. But, you know, the, the truth, the light gets brighter gradually. And, but then later I realized to myself, that's, that's nonsense. That means that we could just believe anything. And, and we could just be humoring ourselves. Yeah. Make it up as we go along. <laughs> you know, yeah. so that 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 was when the very first idea in my mind. That's when it came in 607 BCE. That we, that the truth is not ironclad. Mm. In my conversation with Harry, as someone as a writer respected uh, that 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 our understandings and what we believe to be true is not 100. percent Now then later, as I saw the very human nature of the governing body, some things started to bother me. Uh, sometimes uh, there there would be arguments. Um, there would be, uh, and you would hear the occasional, I, I would sit outside the meeting room, but you could still hear through the doors. And I would bring Brother, I always had to wait there because anytime they had a break, he, he wasn't steady on his feet. And I had to be there at his call to go into the meeting room and get him, collect him, take him to the bathroom. You know, and he, you know, he's in his 90s. Sometimes he had to go when no one else was going. So then I would go in while the meeting was in progress, collect him and then walk out while they're having their meeting. And I would see what they were talking on. And, uh, and I would see, and, and sometimes emotions were flaring. I would have to walk in there and try as quickly as possible, collect him and take him out. And then, you know, just, as, Brother Barr, okay, as Brother Barr told me, when I first got the job, Brother Barr and Brother uh, Jarris spoke a little bit to me. And, really? Yeah, they, well, because, you know, the sensitive nature of the information. Now, of course, my brother... So, so can, can I just kind of make this absolutely clear? What you're saying is that, that you actually heard parts of governing body meetings. Yes. And, of course, later I even read memos. And you had to be briefed on that because because of because you were a helper to Carl Klein, yes. you would actually have to be 
li- listening to snippets of, of official governing body conversations. Yes. And, you know, I was a young elder, too, soon. Mm-hmm. I, 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 had, uh, I was appointed an elder at the age of 24, mm-hmm. so I had become a, a young elder. Mm-hmm. And, um, and but when I first started, I was still a servant. Mm-hmm. And so then soon after, I, I was appointed an elder. But, the, but even, even then, you know, I mean, you're hearing things and you're seeing things that, that, that you know, it's better to give an example. Uh, for example, one time I came in in the meeting and um, I see Brother Henschel is beet red and he has his finger in the chest of Loesch. And, they, and it's obvious they have been shouting. Really? And he was like, you, no, I, you, er. and by this time he had already um, was developing a little bit. He had had some health problems right. that turned into dementia. Right. But at this time he was still giving talks. And he had some halted speech, but he was still considered to be 100% okay. But they felt that he had had an old injury, perhaps I think when he was in one country in Africa, Liberia or something, he took a, a blow to the head. So they thought it was a, a problem with the um, broca, brochia, brochia, you know, the part right. of the brain in the front. So they felt it, that that's what it, it was affecting his speech, but everything cognitively was okay. But to see that, now, okay, I saw that. Now I, you know, in my mindset, like, like when I first got the job, I told you, uh, uh, with working with the older governing body with Klein, uh, you know, that my department overseer spoke with me and then Brother Barr spoke with me. And he, he explained to me the, how, you know, happy they were I was coming there uh, to help. And because and, he worked in the writing department with Klein, too. And how, uh, you know, what a tremendous privilege this, this is. And he, he said, oh, now, Howard, this is a tremendous privilege that you have here to help one of Christ's brothers. He says, oh my, you're actively doing just what Jesus Christ said in Matthew chapter 5. You know, and he, and he said to me that if you so much give a cup of water, a drink, he says, very few people on this earth have such a privilege as you do to actively provide water, to actually provide sustenance, uh, to provide assistance in a practical way to one of Christ's Sorry, that, Im- that impression deserves a standing ovation. That was, that, you absolutely <laughs> so, nailed Jack I don't know Jack how far Barber. to go with that, but that I, was brilliant. And, uh, that was but, and, and he said to me, he said, and you, but he says, remember that you are a tool. And he, and he said, you are a walking stick to our dear brother Carl. And like a walking stick, you see nothing, you hear nothing. But you provide a useful, practical means for our dear brother Klein to get around. Oh, you know, and I, I can remember just like, you know, and, and later he was very, always very, he was one I admired. And that's why I... But you, but unlike a walking stick, you were seeing things and I, you were hearing I couldn't things help that you can't see. unhear. You, you can't know? unhear. And so yeah. going back to um, brother uh, Loesch with his finger into yeah. the chest of Henschel. I no, Henschel know. into the chest of Loach. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, yeah Henschel, with, with Henschel's finger into the chest of Loach. Yeah, he was yeah. the one that was all red. Henschel was. And um, later, early in the morning, like, like the very next day, I'm walking to get Brother Klein uh, in the morning early to help him out. And in the same building, Garrett Loach lived. And he sees me and he says, Howard, come here for a minute. And I go over and I and I speak. I said, "Hi, hi, Brother Loesch. I'm very nervous because I got called. I go, what did I, I think? What did I do wrong? You know, I'm sure I did something." And he and he said to me, he said, "Now, uh, he says, I, I just wanted to make sure you're okay. You know, that, that everything's fine with you. That you're, you know, is there anything that you know that that uh, in your assignment that you find that's that's troubling you or anything that you want to talk about?" And I was like, I'm like "No, no, my goodness, no, nothing's wrong with me." You know, even if there was, there's nothing wrong, you know, and I, and I realized that he's talking about I'm, that incident. Yeah. He said, because he said to me, if ever something comes up, if you see something and you're not quite sure what you've seen or what you've heard and you want to talk to somebody, he says, I want you to know my office door is open anytime. Wow. You just come right to me. Mm-hmm. I says, Oh, thank you, brother Loesch. Thank you. Uh, you know, it's uh, that's something. Mm. But then I realized, though, it was it was because of that that exchange. It must have been, mm. you know, that he was afraid that I had heard something. But I said, no, I saw nothing. I hear nothing. Because he would have been obviously he's Loesch is now the longest serving governing body member. But back then he would have been one of the oh yeah, yeah there he answered yeah yeah because at that time there were still a number of ones, mm. uh, Swingle, Loesch, yeah. Klein, all of them, Henschel, uh, Henschel and Barr were all still there. Wow. And and so, but you know what happened later? 
um, not long after that, uh, uh, well, first we saw the circulating manuscripts within a month later, and then a couple of year, uh, over a year later, we heard about it in the organization throughout the, the regular means of communication. And that is that Brother Hinchel had humbly stepped down from his office as president of the, uh, ah. of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society of, so the, he, of the corporation. So he was, I mean, obviously the whole situation with the presidency changed in 1975. But you're saying that he was trying to kind of maybe leverage that position a little bit again. I don't, I, I from what I had heard um, and talking, just overheard a little bit, yeah. is, is the idea that uh, he had felt some attachment and he felt that it was yeah. kind of a slighting of him. Right. You know, that he... Uh, That's interesting. Um, but I mean, obviously he had to come around to it. But I, but, I thought but to Henschel myself, maybe that... Henschel obviously was one of the survivors from the time of Noor. And he was and the only one to have to step down. Yeah. And I think he might have... And, you know, I don't know if, if maybe perhaps to some degree he was starting to be affected. Mm. Uh, that I don't know. But it yeah. definitely was another year before that came out that he was... And he needed assistance. So take us up um, to... I mean, but we, 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 we were saying just off camera before, we could talk for hours probably yes, about some of yes. the stuff you've seen. But I'm interested to know... What was the... Mental process? Well, what caused you to finally say enough is enough? Okay, so what made me finally reach the conclusion that it was not the truth? Yeah. Because I did come to that conclusion before I actually left. And one thing I enjoyed doing was, was reading, and I've always enjoyed uh, reading uh, things related to science and nature, mm. you know, natural wonders and the universe, that kind of thing. Uh, I didn't know that I was a bit sheltered in the organization. I didn't know that, of course. Who, who? I mean, I didn't come to that realization. I felt that what was given us in the articles was uh, science. It was factual. Uh, when it's when they spoke about science, uh, that it was uh, that it was the truth. But now we realize, uh, once we're out, that that a lot of what we thought we knew about science in the organization was not science at all. Mm. But at that time, I didn't know. But one thing that the uh, the writing department did is they subscribed to a lot of periodicals and journals. Mm. Uh, you know, like the Vatican newspaper, different Christian Today, yeah. um, New, you know, mm. Newsweek, Time magazine, but also like Scientific American and Discovery magazine. And I used to enjoy reading those magazines, just those two particular, Scientific American and Discovery. And it really, uh, it was really interesting. Mm. You know, and there was always a slant about how in the natural sciences, uh, you know, that, that it was just for granted that, I mean, the, the scientific community 100% was behind the idea that life evolved on Earth. Mm. And that uh, the world that we have today is, is very old, the Earth is old, mm. and that life has been around for uh, millions of years on Earth. Mm. And that the Earth itself is, is, uh, is billions of years mm. uh, since uh, it's uh, coming into existence. And of course, you always think to yourself, oh, what do they know? My goodness, those scientists, aren't mm. they? Satan has really got them wrapped around his finger. Mm. Um, I wanted to read something written by a scientist in favor of creation. Mm. And so at that time, I also was getting to know uh, Brother Schroeder, um, working around him for a couple of years, and then later he needed help as well. And a brother was assigned to him to help him out. But at this time, uh, he wasn't receiving that much help. Um, and I would talk to him, and he had an extensive library of books, um, what we would call a worldly library. And he was well read. You know, he himself was a college graduate, so he was known to be Wasn't someone. Wasn't Schroeder involved with Gilead at one point? I oh, yes. He was one of the teachers. He was a, yes, register, yeah. and then um, yeah. was the uh, a main Gilead instructor. That's and, right, yeah. And he also uh, worked with uh, the New World Translation as a scholar, I think, as well. I'm, I think that's right. Is that what you remember? I, I, I'll fact check. I, okay, I, but I, I think he, I think he did. I know he did a lot, and he also worked, uh, you know, with uh, a lot of the information in the, in the early days. So I, I thought if anyone knew of somebody, uh, a book like I was something I, I wanted to read, something juicy, you know, something mm. media, he would know, and it would be a safe pick because he recommended it, you know. So I asked him. I said, Brother Schroeder, uh, is there such a book? And he said, Yes. He said, um, Evolution, A Theory and Crisis by Michael Denton. He said, that is the best book to defend creation, written by a scientist. Got all those evolutionary scientists wiggling in their pants. I said, wow, I'm good. can I borrow your 
No, I don't loan out any of my books. So you go find it. You can find it. You know, so I did. I, I, I found it at the Strands in Manhattan and I bought it. Uh, I read it. Some of it was very interesting. Some of it, it just gave me a, an impression of not, it just didn't seem quite right to me. Uh, and one of the people he talked about was um, Richard Dawkins uh, in the book. And he was debunking, he thought, some of the, the stuff that Dawkins had spoke about. And I, and I thought to myself, you know, I would really like to read something from the other camp. Mm. And uh, so I went down to the, the library there in the Heights and, and I asked for a book by Richard Dawkins. And um, I wanted to read his perspective. You mean in the Bethel Library? No, no, no. Oh. Uh, the Brooklyn Heights Public <laughs> Library. Let's have this image of Richard <laughs> you know, Dawkins in no, the Bethel Library. No, no, no. Okay. I've not seen his no, books. Uh, no. you know, yeah. uh, it's a couple of blocks from Bethel. Yeah, okay. In Cadman Plaza, there's mm. a, 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 a the yeah. worldly library okay. where you can get, uh, you know, Saint, Satan tainted books. Right. So okay. I, I went over there and I, uh, I asked the librarian. I wanted to find a book from Richard Dawkins, and so we looked up cards and, and found um, the the only one that was on the shelf that they had at the moment was, um, um, oh goodness, 1985. The date of the book. What's the name of the book? The blind, the blind watchmaker. The blind watchmaker. Yeah. I, <laughs> my first book. I, 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 I the first time I ever forgotten it. Yeah. The blind watchmaker. Yeah. Uh, Richard Dawkins, and it was an older one, eighty-five. Yeah. And um, so, I started reading it, but I didn't dare check it out. Uh, you know, your you housekeeper. Didn't want to have it against your name. Yes, yeah. and, and your housekeeper, um, which you felt is a safety, but they were they were instructed they watch everything you do. Yeah. I mean, one time I subscribed to uh, Out Magazine, which is like an entertainment magazine, yeah. very benign entertainment yeah. in the city. Yeah. And I got as soon as that first issue hit my dresser, I was called in by Brother Johnson, the home overseer, and I was given a talking to. Wow. Because here I had something that featured entertainment wow. of Satan's world in this horrible uh, city, you know, and I, I didn't even think about it. I yeah. said, you're right, Brother Johnson, you're right. And I canceled my subscription, but that was early on. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and so, so you I basically didn't want anything no. to... I, yeah. if, if she had even noticed that the book, I mean, yeah. uh, a, a book that was pro-evolution, though at this time I was just wanting to read it, you know, yeah. I didn't, I think I, I felt more liberty because I saw that in the writing department so much information was available uh, to the writers and, and to witnesses that I felt I too mm. could read, you know, without it affecting me. I could, I could get an idea mm. of what the other side says yeah. without being, because uh, you know, I've already been reading Scientific American and Discovery, and I, I wasn't, you know, I just, yeah. I, would like, I wanted to read something. And anyway, I didn't, I didn't like the taint of, of Michael Denton's book about evolution, theory, and crisis. I, I felt it was a bit, a bit like nonsense, right. some of it. And I, I, let me read something, I'll see what their nonsense says. Mm. So I read the book, and that's what did it. Right. I had an awakening. So Dawkins, Dawkins worked Dawkins you Dawkins did it. Wow. Dawkins did it. I remember even so vividly, like I won't go into detail, but the illustrations like with the complexity of the eye evolving, mm. how from a simple to a complex, how that evolved. That's one that creationists love to use, isn't it? Oh, well, how could, you, how could an eye evolve? But there yeah. are very Amazing. obvious reasons why an oh. eye would evolve, yeah. And it, yeah. it just made sense. Yeah. So many things that he discussed in that book, I didn't even know existed. Yeah. Because I never allowed myself to pick up a book yeah. and educate myself. Mm -hmm. To the point that at one point, I would only go to the library and read it. Mm -hmm. And I kept a marker in the book at the library. Kept it in the library and I would go and read it at the library. After work, when I could, it took me a good couple of months to read it finally. It took a while. And at one point, though, I sat on the floor sobbing oh. in the library. Mm. I mean, just tears coming to my eyes because I realized that what I believed wasn't real. Mm. And that my whole life had been a waste. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Excuse me. <laughs> no, it's, it, it is a it, profound moment. It is yeah. because the gay 14-year-old boy mm. was still there. Mm. And I had been such a failure at overcoming that. And I had carried so much guilt mm. all of my life mm. because of what 
I felt I was mm. as something unnatural, an abomination, and, I, and that I couldn't cure myself. I was so disappointed with myself and even steps I had tried so hard. And then I, I started to come to the realization that, the, that I would never change, that perhaps then a new world cure was the only hope for me and I would just have to continue with this thorn in my flesh. But then when I read something that so completely was so alien to everything that I had known before mm. and was so mind opening, even though I didn't grasp everything, I knew what I was on the cusp of here. I knew what I was on the verge of with this. And it was the unraveling of everything I had known. Mm. And that all those years before, I, I was living under a, a created delusion Mm. that, that uh, you know, I wasn't getting into motives at that time, but at best, I came to the realization that my religion was no more the truth than any other religion. Mm. And that was quite a, that was quite, at that time, I wouldn't say I, I'd become atheist. At that time, I, I was not sure about the existence of God and how much input he had into life on earth. I mean, that I do not know mm. at that time. I did not think about. But what I did know was, if that God existed, he was not Christian. Yeah. Mm. And that he was not using the Bible. Mm. That, the, that mankind's existence on the earth was not 6,000 years. Mm. Uh, and, and that animals had been here for millions, and that we had been here for hundreds of thousands of years. And that nothing, nothing, everything else started to make sense. Then when I read something in Scientific American or in Discovery, I realize, yes, this is true. I mean, this, this makes sense. And when I read about um, carbon dating, because then now everything I oh, wanted to... Oh, that's the favorite one, isn't oh, it, with JWs? They like to say, wanted... oh, well, we can't trust oh, carbon dating. <laughs> what, a, what, a, what a skewed, yeah. narrow-minded reasoning uh, our, our old religion, the Jehovah's Witnesses, have put on that. And, and, and then, oh yes, here, we'll support the use of carbon dating for this. Well, but then this. when it comes to supporting this, we don't, you know. So it's, yeah. it's all this thing started to, started to unravel. So mentally then I realized that it wasn't the truth. I began, you know, it was gradual. Even then I was, I, I just, it took time. But then I wasn't sure what to do with myself. Well, I was going to say, when most people reach this realization, they're, they're not at the epicenter of their religion <laughs> they can they have at least some distance yes. so that they can kind of start planning things here you are right in the epicenter of where it's all happening yeah. so how do you how do you even go about extricating yourself from that 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 was the that was what that perplexed me yeah. i mean that that was the big obstacle that i had to overcome <laughs> also the mental hurdle of, of realizing that all right so it's not the truth uh, it's not special but is it so bad? Mm. Is it so bad to continue to be a part of it? Um, also, uh, your family, mm. because everything I knew of my community was tied to the witnesses. I had been a very devout good boy. I hadn't had any connections outside the organization, mm. none. I had no relatives, no family, nobody. Mm. I said, so worst case scenario, I just uh, blaze a trail and I'm stuck homeless in New York City. Mm. <laughs> I'm like, but nowhere to go, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, so all of this, these fears, you know, I, I, I let, I, it was easier for quite a while just to keep doing what I've been doing mm -hmm. and just not, try not to think about it and try not to, to make waves and just, uh, and he, that's why I think about even, even today, I wonder how many are in the organization, like Harry, Harry Poloy and that senior writer mm -hmm. that I talked to about prophecy. Yeah. How, and you mentioned how, how, how many are in and, and, and on different levels realize that what they believe is not true, how many actually maybe believe that it's not the truth. Mm. But one advantage that others might have had that I didn't have is they, they were able to get married mm. and they were able to have some sense of uh, identity yeah. as a human mm. that was denied me uh, because of my being gay. Mm. And I was very lonely mm. and I was very depressed and I felt as uh, when thinking about it that I was wasting my life. Yeah. And, and those things are what eventually made me realize that despite what fallout there may be, I had to push forward mm. and I had to make a stand and I had to do something about it. Yeah. And, and then I did. Yeah. And then I did. But I, it was gradual too. I wasn't sure how to do it. Mm. So the first thing I did was leave. At that time, I was already working at the Stanley Theater. I had, I'd, I'd been in Brooklyn for uh, seven and a half years. Mm. 
taking care of some family stuff. And then uh, from Brooklyn was assigned to the Jersey City Assembly Hall, the Stanley Theater yeah. across the water. And I was there for uh, the last few years. And, uh, and most of that time I was, I was awoke by then. Yeah. And I was just going through you know, the motions. But I, um, yeah. You managed to get out. I did. And fast forward to today, I'm, I'm uh, instantly struck by how, I, I know it's, it's always difficult to kind of reach any conclusions when you're just swinging by on a visit, but it seems to me you have a perfectly idyllic life here. You've got, <laughs> you've got your, uh, your, your kids, your, yes. your husband. You see the evidence of them around. You've got a beautiful home. <laughs> Thank um, you. Uh, do you have any regrets and what's the current are you being shunned at the moment I guess Am I on? have zero regrets making the decision to leave mm. other than that I wished I had done it earlier right I wish that I had had the courage to do it when I first woke up mm. I wished I'd woken up yeah. before I'd ever went mm. uh, because you know I, 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 I won't say too much but there's quite a learning curve mm. and I had to go through some lean time some mm. lean months and years for a while mm. uh, when i did eventually leave i had a little bit of a game plan and i tried to save money and working at the uh, assembly hall was better for that because uh, it w you got five hundred dollars a month as opposed to the hundred dollars mm. you got as a bethelite they right. gave you a larger stipend right. but i really could hoard and eat ramen i started my my ramen noodle diet at the stanley I and see. then i carried it on uh, and I was renting a room uh, from a man uh, who rented rooms out of his house when, mm. I, when I did leave. Mm. And it was not a desirable situation. No. Um, awful, awful. I had to put a padlock on the door, but the, the roof, it leaked water when it rained and he wouldn't give, we didn't have proper heating or air conditioning mm. and it gets cold and hot. And I mean, it wasn't ideal. And I had a hot plate that I cooked off of, but I, I, I was so happy though that I had, that I left and that I was on my way to something better. Yeah. And I immediately, and I actually, I had taken off, I had saved a month of vacation and that last month that I was uh, at, at the Stanley Theater, I actually was working at my new job. I found a job oh, okay. yeah. and I said, oh, I'm taking a month off and it's yeah. my last month, here's my notice. Yeah. And I worked, started working as a waiter in Manhattan. Fantastic. And, uh, and so I was able to save money and I worked night and day. I quit going to meetings and I also had enrolled in college. At the, there's a com, uh, community college right next door to the, the Stanley Theater called Hudson County. I started going there, Fantastic. taking classes. I was taking the, um, you know, the, the, the basic classes of, mm. of English and math because I, I had gotten my GED mm. uh, having had not graduated. So I needed to start uh, proving that I could have the aptitude for college. And then, mm. uh, so then fast forward, um, I finally got my degree. And uh, I became a registered nurse. Right. Oh, fantastic. And uh, I was working as a, I worked as a, pedi a pediatric nurse, uh, mm. but I've been staying home with the kids now since they were born four years ago, our mm. twins, Ava and Aiden. But, you know, you, you asked, uh, are there any regrets? No, there's right. no regrets. It's a shame that we had to spend the time we did. I know that there's some learning that took place by our past experiences. I could not help but think that it might have been better used elsewhere. Otherwise, yeah. could have been, uh, but it is what it is. So your, your only regret is that you didn't wake up sooner, yeah. basically. Yeah, because I, you asked about shunning. Yeah. It is true. I lost all of that network. It was a complete loss. It did take a while at first because when I went down there. Do you have family them, who was shunning you? My grandmother and mother who I was closest to, the ones who I had helped uh, over the years. Uh, they were my closest relatives. And um, we talked on the phone every week when we were all witnesses. Mm. I spent every vacation. They would come up and stay at Bethel with me and even at the Stanley Theater. We, it was, I would have them come up. Uh, we were very close. Mm. And uh, when I flew down there and told them that I no longer believed it was the truth and I told them um, that I planned to explore, that I, I, never cure, I said I was never cured mm. of being gay. And they, they were shocked. They said, oh, well, we thought you had cured yourself. You know, we thought you were over this. You know, they're thinking back from when I was 14. They yeah. thought it was a done deal. I was a success story. Yeah. I said, no, it never left me. Yeah. And that I have been miserably uh, you know, lonely all this time. Yeah. And, I, and that I plan to explore that side of me. I told yeah. them. Yeah. And uh, my mom, uh, she, we were all in tears. And she, she, uh, she cried. She said, well, I'll always love you. And, uh, and gave me a hug. And, and, and uh, my grandmother, she looked at me. And she said, I'll have to get back with you on this one. 
the uh, you know the pioneer zealot. She she says, "I'll get back with you." And they've not spoken to you since. Or... I have tried at different times. My grandmother's now dead, right? Uh, but I didn't find out till after the fact. Really? Then, uh, they didn't even tell you. No, this? they didn't tell me she was sick. She was sick, but she had asked that I not be told. Wow. And then she was actually my closest because my mom had had health issues, mm. and my grandmother was our one consistent parent in the family mm. my grandmother especially in my late teen years and she had helped take care of mom so that i could go to bethel mm. and she actually cared for mom until she died because mom had long-standing mental issues now mother has alzheimer's i've heard right and she's in a nursing home right uh, but still they won't she won't talk to me now so um but no she didn't want me informed i only knew that she died because one of the local elders uh called me up and said your grandmother's dead she was sick and she died. And we wanted to let you know, your mother is having troubles paying for the expenses. Uh, we are looking to gather funds, but it would be nice since you are her living relative if you would willingly help out. And uh, so John and I did. We, we sent a check to cover for cremation and for the flowers in the Kingdom Hall. And that was it. Even though you weren't in welcome. Yeah, I, you know, so... Astonishing. That was my last thing I could do for Grandma. Uh, so that was it for her. And I, you know, you miss, you miss mm -hmm. them. You yeah. miss them. You never. Mm -hmm. I, I, to this day, I have such uh, fond memories of my grandmother because my early childhood there was a lot of instability with my parents, mm -hmm. and and we grew up in a very depressed area, and we had very little growing up in Arkansas, and my grandmother was the one who came with the winter coats mm -hmm. and the new shoes, and without her. We, we wouldn't have been able to make it uh, mm. because what we got with uh, food stamps and our commodities mm. uh, just didn't stretch far enough. And my parents had a hard time. They never, they couldn't, they struggled with providing. Mm. So grandmother was always, even my earliest memories as a child, she was the one who helped, mm. you know. And then when we moved to Oklahoma, after my parents divorced and mom moved us there, she continued to mm. be a big support and she was the one big loss. I remember one time I, I got him and I was talking to them on the phone and I was, it was when grandma finally decided she had to cut me off completely. Mm -hmm. And I had the conversation with her. She said to me, she says, I don't know about you, Howard. She says, uh, you're too smart to have been deceived by Satan. She said, so it's just obvious to me that you are deceiving us. So it's a great big joke on us, isn't it? And that really, that, that, that hurt. Yeah. Because uh, who would do that? Yeah. I said to her, Grandma, I said, nobody in their right mind would carry out a, a ruse this yeah, long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not in your <laughs> it interest. Does, it doesn't to, even make sense, you know, the thinking. It's I, not in your interest no, to trick people for that. Like, no, no, yeah. it didn't. Mm. So, you know, I I realized then it was a loss. But I guess she's just trying to, she was just trying to rationalize yes, things. Yes, because it couldn't be mm. not, it couldn't be the obvious answer mm. that it's not the truth. Mm. No, she could not allow herself to make that, mm. to make that, 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 you know, jump. Um, either I was deceiving or being deceived. And she had, she had decided that, at least in that conversation, that I was deceiving. And uh, my last conversation with uh, my mother, she said that she couldn't talk to me anymore and that sh I shouldn't write to her. Because I had been sending pictures of the kids after the kids were born, mm. trying to reestablish a contact. You know, you go through yeah, this. Yeah. You think, well, maybe this. And I, and I even even that first time Just when I... Just trying to appeal to the humanity. Yes. Yeah. And even that first time when I told them I didn't believe it was the truth, I never... I mean, I, I was hoping they would ask questions, which they didn't. But I didn't say anything. I didn't push anything. Mm. As I felt that maybe then that would leave them more open to having a, a relationship. And I did talk to them a couple of times on the idea that many people of different religions are in the same family and mm. they, they're able to peacefully and, and happily coexist mm. and even have a nice family bond. And I said, I hope that one day we have that, though mm. we may not share the same religious outlook, that mm. we don't have to discuss religion. It doesn't even have to be part of our discussion, mm. but we can still be family yeah. and still enjoy a family relationship. Even, especially when the grandkids came, just just for even so that they will know you mm. and know my family because my husband uh, comes from a very accepting buddhist family uh, and his family is beautiful but they do wonder they, they will ask me at first now yeah. they know mm. they would say well where's your family you know are we going to meet them 
and, and I, for them to get their heads no, around. No, there's nobody. It's unthinkable to many mm. that how could you abandon your children? I mean, you may slap them upside the head when the, you know they're adults for their decisions, mm. but that's what, what Mom, Mama Mui implied, uh, John's mom, uh, that you know you might be mad at them, but how can you do this? This is unthinkable. Yeah. And it really is unthinkable. It is. It, it's inhumane. It is. And so I, I um, excuse me, a fly. But um, so that last conversation with mom, uh, she said to me, she said, uh, we can't, we can't write. She was in tears on the phone. I spoke to her. She said, you can't call me anymore. And you can't write to me anymore. She said, because uh, any relationship with you is an act of unfaithfulness to Jehovah. Any. And she said, this is the way it's got to be until you, until you realize what you're doing is wrong. And so after that, that was, that was it. So. Astonishing. But again, you're, you're here now and you're happy. Yeah. And... yeah. and that really is the point. Yeah. Because even those losses mm. are completely, completely outweighed by the mm. joys. Yeah. My life, I mean, obviously you have your, your issues with life. But the fact is, is life is wonderful. Yeah. It is worth the struggle. Yeah. It is worth the beauty. Yeah. Because there is so much beauty to be had yeah. that you just don't know about until mm -hmm. you, you get out there and, and start seeing and testing your limits and finding what it is that's out there. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, we're doing, we, we, I, I met someone, we fell in love, we got married when it was illegal here. We went to Canada and got married. Wow. Two, uh, you know, oh, 10 years now. It's been 10 years. Some been road trip, isn't Almost it? Almost 10 years, yeah. <laughs> with, the, with the Canada, got married. And then, then later we fought for equality and, and marriage rights here. Yeah. And uh, he has been my, uh, my soul, soulmate companion. And then we decided to expand our family. We were living in New York City, and mm. then we moved to New Jersey, and the twins were born. And uh, Well, great. all I can say is that you thoroughly deserve it. Thank you. And I really appreciate you sharing all that. Thank you so me. much. I'm sure everyone's going to really enjoy uh, hearing those stories. And you're, you're also going to give hope, I believe, to others who are in that situation now. And I, I, when, I'm, when I say that situation, I'm talking about that situation of being convinced to believe that they're not quite acceptable. Yeah. Um, and you, you overcame that. So thank you so much. And uh, we'll leave it there. But thanks so much for your hospitality. Well, thank and, you for uh, coming. I hope that this isn't the last video that we do together because I, I sense that there's some more that we can <laughs> well, <laughs> we can talk about. You no, know, there is so much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But thank you there for is. what you have shared. Well, and, thank uh, you. We'll we'll leave it there. So, bye bye. Goodbye. <laughs>